We need gate resolve. Off balance, economic sanctions are reducing the threat of Russian coastal supply chain interests. Tension one is the empire strikes back. There are four reasons why sanctions increase Russian aggression. First is nationalism. Sanctions offer a unique ability for people to lose nationalist sentiment. According to the last of the Journal of Political Risk, in 2015, international isolation caused by sanctions allows the target government to control ideas and information within their society and to nurture nationalism. Bertoli of UC Berkeley in 2013 confirms that nationalism can undermine international cooperation, motivate societies to fight costly wars, and cause governments to overestimate their, overestimate their relative military power. Second is oligarchs. Targeted sanctions on business oligarchs are shifting Russia's political hierarchy. Weber of the Week in 2014 explains that Putin has cost the most powerful Russian businessmen's companies hundreds of millions of dollars in market value. As a result, Leonard of the European Council on Foreign Relations in 2014 writes that sanctions have marginalized pro-Western members of the Russian elite, while military hardliners have been strengthened more than ever before. As a result, Wire of the Christian Science Monitor in 2015 finds that members of Russia's military security establishment are now shaping the Kremlin's foreign policy. These hardliners are the reason why Ukrainian rebels are still pushing their offensive and talking of building 100,000 strong reserve army to bring the fight to Kiev. Third is anti-Westernism. Sanctions provide the perfect cover for Moscow to redirect attention from its failed economic policies to blame the West. Peleshuk in 2014 writes in Salon that Putin has sidestepped the severity of Russia's tanking economy. Instead, he blames the West for attempting to sabotage his own country's economy, comparing Western sanctions against Russia to Adolf Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union. Siamese of the National Interest in 2015 finds that with 66% of Russians believing that Western sanctions are meant to weaken and humiliate Russia, many have rallied around the flag and embraced Putin as a protector against foreign onslaught. Many regard sanctions as assaults on themselves in addition to their country. Fourth is economic harms. Sanctions are contributing significantly to Russia's economic woes. Bogani of PBS writes in 2015 that because of sanctions, no financial institutions have dared to provide Russia with any financing. As a result of financial sanctions, Russia cannot mitigate its recession by borrowing money. In addition to losing a safety net, Dresdner in 2015 also finds that in 2014, more than $150 billion in private sector capital left Russia to avoid the prospect of sanctions. The Economist in 2015 furthers that Russians value two qualities, wealth and military strength. The less Putin can provide the former at home, the more he must demonstrate the latter abroad. Guriev in 2014 of the Financial Times furthers that recession means Russia's government can no longer use money to buy public acceptance. Repression and propaganda have to take up the slack. Nothing could be more helpful than a small victorious military adventure, and it has spawned an aggressive foreign policy to which Western leaders are now struggling to respond. There are two places where Russia has increased aggression against the West in the real world. First is Ukraine. According to Gibbons' death of the Washington Post as of New Year's Eve, a true ceasefire is a ways off. The fact that the number of ceasefire violations in the last weeks of December had increased in Ukraine reflects a worrying development as the year ends. In December, there was a marked increase in fighting. Second is Syria. Word of the Star in 2015 reports that Russia's military action to Syria is avoiding East Western sanctions that punish Moscow for its incursions into Ukraine. Throughout the entire world, conflict between the West and Russia has increased. Soldopian of Reuters in 2016 confirms that as a result of this aggression, a new radio named the United States as one of the greatest threats to Russia's national security for the first time, a sign of how relations with the West have deteriorated in recent years. Letsky of Texas A&M in 2007 quantifies, finding that sanctions increase the probability of militarized conflict by 17%. All events of the Telegraph in 2015 reports that Russia and NATO are actively preparing for war in Europe, amid the greatest buildup of military tension in Europe since the end of the Cold War. For these reasons, we need. Contention 1 containing expansion. British Journal of 
British general branch off from NATO observes that Russian expansionist ambitions could quickly become an obvious existential threat to our whole being. However, sanctions reduce this threat in three ways. First, credibility. Lip from Lancaster University explains that sanctions decrease Russia's intent to attack by boosting Russian credibility in Moscow. The West asked Russia not to intervene in Ukraine, but was not listened to because its track record allowed Moscow to assume that it will annex easily. However, the West adopted sanctions, leaving the impression and influencing Moscow's calculations in the future. Fred Kaplan from the Council on Foreign Relations furthers that sanctions deter Putin from going further because his actions are those of an opportunistic tactician. He will go as far as he can, but no farther. In fact, Dreyer indicates that this is currently materializing because sanctions made Russia factor in Western responses, which seems not to have been the case prior to Crimea, thus deterring Moscow from seizing Mariupol. Papa from the UNC empirically confirms this effect of credibility, quantifying that the success rate climbs to 94% when the costs of the target are severe. Second, sectorial sanctions. Ignomsev explains that Russia imports more than 50% of the electronics used in Russian military equipment, and as a result, sanctions prevent military expansion, as the NATO review indicates that economic sanctions restrict access to Western services for Russian defense sectors and place an embargo on exports to Russia of military goods. Simone de Galbert explains that as a result, sanctions impact Russia's modernization plans, which limits Russia's military power, as Majumdar from the National Interest reports that Russia needs to modernize their military because Russia's armed forces are still armed with hardware from the 1970s. Thus, Dan McCormack empirically indicates that sanctions on the sources of military power are particularly effective as alternative suppliers are often unavailable. Looking at Russia specifically, he quantifies that sanctions destroy 40% of a country's military power. Third, costly occupations. Larry Hanauer indicates that Russian invasions are expensive and that annexation will be a $4.5 billion drain. However, Ben Aris quantifies that sanctions cost Russia $400 billion. Thus, constricting the Russian economy prevents further occupation because Schumann from Time explains that the axiom of global geopolitics is that a country can project power only as far as its economics allow. Henry Pasco continues that sanctions decrease Moscow's ability to pay for occupations, leading Brookings to conclude that what Russia could not afford to win is Ukraine. Sanctions worked in this manner by preventing the Russian seizure of Kiev. As a result, Katz concludes that economic sanctions on Russia limit Putin's ability to fund expansionism. Contention 2. Civil War. Regina Smythe observed that the specter of civil war hangs over Ukraine, but Russia is responsible for this civil war, as Polyakova indicates that Putin orchestrated the military takeover of the Crimea, which is problematic for Western security interests, as Michael Brown from the George Washington University indicates that this civil war is the result of Putin's expansionist agenda to establish Russian spheres of influence in Europe while maintaining confrontation with the West. As a result, if left unchecked, Finland from Cambridge expects to see the conflict expanding beyond Ukraine's borders into the EU. Fortunately, sanctions can reduce this threat in two ways. First, the flow of funds. Polyakova explains that the war in Ukraine is a Kremlin manufactured conflict because, the, because of the continued influx of Russian weapons. However, sanctions can solve for that as Polish empirically indicates that sanctions cut the total flow of funds to the rival parties, increasing the probability of war termination by 30%. Second, preventing frozen conflicts. Alex Modal explains that by generating crisis in the Ukraine, Putin validated his strategy of frozen conflicts, which he used to manipulate Moldova, Armenia, and Georgia. Stapleton from Cato elaborates the Ukrainian ceasefire could turn into a frozen conflict, although the West has leverage over Russia in the form of economic sanctions, which entice Putin to cooperate in negotiating a permanent settlement in the Ukraine. Which is currently materializing is Simon de Galbert warns that sanctions put a negotiating process in place by creating incentives for Russia to complete the 2014 Ukraine and 2015 Normandy negotiations. Conclusively, Olina Okukina empirically quantifies that increasing the target's cost will increase the probability of their compliance by 57%. For all these reasons, we strongly urge a cost per about. I see 40%, 90%, uh, 94%, and the golden. 94 and less? The, okay, so the one cost or high car, one for one. The 30% card, one for two. And the 30% card, one for two. Okay, can we take a cross I was...
So here's the problem. Let's start with like Syria, for example. Right? So right, right now, America is literally pumping weapons to the opposition like, that like that's in but, Syria. So like when but, Russia wants to go against these like people, they're going to have to be able to combat the West. Here's the thing: like Russia is also using airstrikes and drone strikes, which are more effective than having ground troops in the area. Like the ability of Russian right. ground strikes to like actually just blow them up before right. they even see them doesn't mean they need a modern gun. They just need an airplane. Right, but to have a better airplane, this like the problem is America has actually started airstrikes just as well. What does the better airplane do? Like as a, it makes them more likely to win. How much? Like, how, how much is it? Obviously, having better military equipment makes you more likely to win. But like, what I'm saying is like the comparative between Russia and the states they're intervening in is so vast. Like the difference between Ukrainian's military power and Russia's military power right. is so absolutely like astronomically different that having a different right. tank doesn't matter. When it's backed by the by America, it does matter. So it like, what do they give? Russia. Just really, just really quick. What is Russia giving Ukraine? What is the West giving Ukraine? In terms America's of actually starting to threaten to give lethal weapons into Ukraine. Threat, not what? give. So we haven't seen it happen yet. Okay, sure. Do you mind pass a question? Absolutely. So you talk about how there's been like less diplomacy in like Ukraine and Syria and more aggression, right? Uh, I talk about more aggression. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. So what's happening in Syria as of this month? What's happening in Syria as of this month? Yeah. Oh, are you going to talk about the UN peace deal that Russia signed? Which sure. they violated two days later? Two days later. <laughs> two days later. They <laughs> violated that peace so deal let's, let's, right in Russia, right. right in Syria. Right. But here's the problem. In a world without sanctions, would they have even agreed to that peace deal? Uh, I don't know. Right? But the whole point is that the peace deal did literally nothing. Right, but here's the thing. Like, literally, exactly. like they signed a peace deal and said, oh, wait, I'm going to continue my airstrikes. Right, right. it doesn't matter. Here's the problem. In a world without sanctions, like we, uh, like an imperfect ceasefire is still going to be better than no ceasefire if we let Russia continue to do whatever we do. If they're still aggressive in Syria, That's what did the ceasefire do? Okay, well then let me ask you a question. Sure. What's the alternative to sanctions? Let Russia, Russia continue to be a name and chain them. We could do diplomacy with they Paris. Just literally a hundred thousand All different foreign policy options. Like here's the problem. Okay, it's not my burden to prove mutual right. exclusivity with a hundred. I'm not saying that it's mutually exclusive. Like, one of the things is there's a hundred different diplomatic ideas that we can integrate like with or without what? sanctions. I just told you, like we can name and shame them. Which we can do diplomacy with a carrot. We can end up having a world where What's we actually what do you diplomacy do? with a carrot like incentives? Yes. Right, like, incentives like lifting a like sanction or right, incentives yeah, yeah. like you're helping problem. the Russian economy when they're in debt, then in order to like if you pull out of your right, so help your economy with like you know FDI. Like things like that okay. will work out Here's in the long term. Putin was not going to think the same way that you're thinking. Why not? Because telling him that we're gonna help your economy if you pull out the Ukraine isn't going to think it's like also not our problem to prove alternatives. <laughs> Thank you. 
case. They tell you that economic harm to Russia is only more of an incentive to intervene because Russians value two things. The first is economic might, and the second is military might and power projection. And ultimately, if they're harming the economy through sanctions, which is what they tell you is the internal link to every impact in their case, you're ultimately going to see more Russian aggression in the long term. The second overview comes from the Royal Institute. They corroborate this, telling you that economic harms are the root cause of Russian aggression. Meaning if Russia's economy is strong, they won't be aggressive. If it's what happens is vice versa, which is what's happening in their world, then you're only going to see Russian be, uh, Russian be more expansionist. But secondly, remember, Russia is still the second strongest military in the world, meaning on net, even if they're slightly less capable, they're still going to have the capacity to intervene militarily and to destabilize the countries in the Eastern Bloc, in the Balkans, places where they might attempt to intervene against Western interests. Ultimately, they still have the capacity to do as much as they need to do, which is ultimately why you don't affirm the resolution. With that being said, their first intention talks about credibility shifts. The first problem is that we're all shifting the receptiveness of the government of Russia against that type of against the type of credibility. Which is what we tell you in the case when you say that there's an increase in the power of Russian military of Russian milita uh, military leaders. Ultimately, that's going to turn the argument against them. But then, remember, they really importantly tell you that it's only 94 percent successful when the costs are high. They don't tell you whether or not the costs imposed by the sanctions on the center country are large enough to meet that bright line. Which more importantly leads me to my third response, which is that their own evidence says that sanctions fail 62 percent of the time when there's not a large cost to sender, meaning ultimately on net the probability that the sanctions will succeed is extremely low. But then, Kazakh News Week tells you that all of the evidence that they're talking about in this case is not going to happen for a few reasons. First, because we tell you in Syria, they're already intervening militarily as a response to this, meaning that the, the, the economic incentive of sanctions is not working. But secondly, he tells you that they simply divert the way that they attack other countries. They do things like economic attacks, political destabilization, terrorism, and subterfuge. All of those cost a lot less money and ultimately continue the same pattern of destabilization that we've seen in the Ukraine and we've seen them have the potential to do in other countries throughout the Eastern Bloc. But then a couple places where this isn't happening. First, Ibn Zdef tells you that none of this is functioning in the real world because the fighting is continuing at the same level. But then we also tell you that there's a build-up of troops we can turn the argument against them. But then you can look to Pexin. He turns the argument against them when he tells you that the government becomes less credible because it's less receptive to its people since sanctions give the government cover to isolate the government from its people. Meaning, ultimately, the government, the political calculus is going to change. The people will no longer have power within Russia. And ultimately, you're going to see a change in the political calculus that's going to outweigh every impact in their case. Contention 2 talks about military expansion and electronics. First on electronics, they don't tell you why Russia needs more electronics to destabilize countries like Ukraine. They're doing a pretty good job of ruining the country without a modern military. But the second problem with this is according to Reuters, they've shielded their budget for modernization because Putin cares a lot about his ability to power protect. Then you can look to Franz Gatti, who tells you that they're shielding their budget from defense specifically, which is why ultimately you're not seeing a decline in the overall military spending in Russia. But then you can turn it a couple of ways. Even if you don't buy either of those responses, Matino Renz gives you two reasons why you turn the argument against them. First, a weak military magnifies any perceived threat, which pushes them more towards the like perceived threats in the first place, which means that they're going to be acting preemptively, ultimately spurring more war, pushing us over the brink like we talked about at the bottom of the case. But then it tells you that she further tells you that they're going to act more aggressively to try and convince their possible enemies that they're stronger than they really are, which means that ultimately Russia's going to try to flex its muscles if it feels like other countries are imposing its rule against them. With that being said, Contention 2 talks about civil war. There's a lot of problems with this. The first is that all of it it's talking about is how there's going to be less of a flow of funds and ultimately it's going to prevent a, full, a frozen conflict. The really big problem with all of the impacts in this contention is that they're manifesting in the real world in a world with sanctions. They're not preventing a frozen conflict. The conflict in the Ukraine is frozen, but it's approaching the brink because Russia's continuing to destabilize the country by pushing more funds into the hands of separatists. They're really shifting the way that they attempt to approach the problem, but moreover, we tell you that in Syria, they're also attempting to destabilize the conflict on net, so you turn the argument against them once more. But then, remember, they're telling you that as a result of the expansionist agenda that all of this is happening with their intervention in the civil war and their bolstering of that is occurring. Remember the warrant that we give you, that the pro-Western government officials are now being replaced by militarized officials who have even more of an incentive to attempt to do so because they're more aligned with the military, meaning you turn the argument against them once more. But then, lastly, they tell you that there's an incentive to compete in negotiations. They don't tell you whether or not those negotiations are actually manufacturing any calculated risk, where you can look to the Center for Strategic Institute, which tells you that overall the only reason why there was a ceasefire implemented at all was because American arms were moving into Ukraine.
obviously. in the threat, not an elimination of the threat that becomes relevant in the crossfire, and we'll get to it later. So, now let's get to specifically how sanctions actually being put into place are going to be the return of the Jedi. First, on their link one, which is nationalism, Insomov said explains that even if Russians hate the West, they love money more. Thus, the increased nationalism is a short-term glue in the face of long-term economic coercion, meaning the pro outweighs. You should flow that across the entire round, because that means the social contract is violated. It doesn't matter what's going on outside that. But then second, Dreyer indicates that sanctions have shattered Putin's social contract, and historically the model of nationalism fails without any tangible economic benefit because it's necessary to back up the nationalist agenda. Thus, even if you buy the nationalism increase, it reforms the system in the long term because it will collapse Putin's system. Thus, you can turn their link. But then, Stegobayev from Colombia indicates that regimes built like Putin's are based on material reimbursement and have no alternative method for ensuring support. Taking away that support means the pro solves in the long term because he's not able to pay out to his citizens. Even if you buy the link, sanctions take away Putin's only system of gaining support, so our link outweighs. Then go to the second link, which is oligarchs. Hill indicates that sanctions are actually triggering opposition from the country's liberal population, meaning these voices validate the logic behind sanctions to use economic pressure to convince the elite to turn against Mr. Putin. We're going to get to the materialization of all this in a minute, but essentially the argument makes the analysis that by putting pressure on those close to Putin, we'll see a change in his foreign policy. Then go to the next link, which is anti-Westernism. First, Birnbaum indicates that Russia's political leaders are going to fuel anti-Western sentiment regardless of economic sanctions. Strike them down because their link is non-unique, and negating does nothing to actually solve their problem. But second, Anti-Western sentiment in Russia has existed long before the Cold War. This is hardly unique to economic sanctions, at the point where they get up here and ask struggle to quantify ridiculous numbers, make them quantify to you how much anti-Western sentiment increased as a result of sanctions measured against how much existed before. But, to go further, Tufts University argues that not that many people support Putin anyway and are likely to blame him more than anyone else, since overwhelmingly, the propaganda machine that he perpetuates forces those people to agree no matter what, which means the sentiment is growing in the status quo. Then look to the next link, which is economic harms. First, they tell you that the trade-off with economic harms is going to be increased foreign policy taking in order to support his population. This is literally what happened in Ukraine before we even implemented sanctions. Their entire argument is not unique. At the point where they're telling you as a result of economic harms, we'll see increased invasion, he rallies his people behind foreign policy goals no matter what. It's literally the reason that he seized Ukraine to garner popular support. Then, remember the analysis that's made under Link 1 that economics will always outweigh foreign policy because economics is necessary to back up the social contract when the refrigerator effect kicks in like it is now and we see that Russians can't even afford to feed their families, we're going to see a violation of the social contract and a turn on the system. Now we get to their impacts. First, they talk about Ukraine. Their evidence is outdated. Stratfor says on December 30th that Moscow is pushing for the Minsk protocols, and as a result, in the last week of 2015, the number of violations has decreased, going from 50 per day down to a dozen per day. This is really important, because he gets up in crossfire and tells you that it was violated two days later. Literally doesn't matter at all. Because under the ceasefire, there are fewer casualties, which right there you can affirm, because we're actually solving the problem. We don't have to get rid of the threat, we just have to reduce it. At the point where fewer people are dying, we can solve that problem right there. But then... Remember the sanctions prevented the seizure of Kiev and Mariupol. Right there you can affirm, because the real point of these sanctions was to stop Russia coal in their tracks, which is exactly what it did. But then, cross-apply contention too, where we tell you that we solved the conflict in the Ukraine through the flow of funds and through preventing frozen conflicts, because if they actually think Ukraine is that bad, they should offer us an alternative as to how that's going to be solved if we take sanctions off Russia and allow them to do whatever they want there. But then, go to Syria. Even Obama, the Obama administration admits that Russia is a constructive partner in Syria and they advocate for their involvement. At that point, it literally doesn't matter what happens with sanctions because the West is asking them to intervene. And then further, the conflict in Syria has been raging for five years. It's impossible to quantify how much Russia added to that, and it's not going to stop when sanctions go away. For all these reasons, I affirm. Right, um, can I see down the last piece of evidence? And... Uh, Syria? Yeah. 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 The Obama crime. 
much influence does this liberal opposition have? Significant. The liberal opposition so, so wait, so, so in response to our second contention, you said that they're anti-Western and they don't like Western ideas. And then in response to our second word, you tell us that the liberal opposition is not political sway. Who's anti-Western specifically? Who's anti-Western specifically? I would say the Russian populace is more anti-Western. Right, and then I would the say, liberal minority is what we're talking about, right? So how much so power do they have? The liberal minority is important because minority opposition is key to understanding how so, the system of so Russia works, right? In the context of the Russian you government, how much power does a liberal minority have? Are you trying to get me to quantify it? Because that doesn't exist. Like just so the minority, a minority opposition in Russia historically has always been necessary to overturn the existing system. Look at the past five so revolutions in Russian history. Overturn the existing system. Right. So what is the trend of the system right now? That's a complicated question. So there's the trend of the system in the Okay, so who are the most important people in Russian foreign policy conflicts? Also a complicated question. The most important person is Putin, and then those that are next important are probably the ones that are surrounding them. Right. So what's Putin's approval rating right now? Approval ratings are like wildly around the They're like 90%, right? So obviously they're not, doing something. They're right? definitely not 90%. You're absolutely asking for approval ratings from Russian government sources in a country where the leader who they're asking like, imagine they call your house, and you know that yesterday they shot someone because he disagrees. That's not a relevant poll. You mind if I ask a question, though? Just put a lot of time on that. Right. So when you start talking about, like, ceasefires, right? So, like, if we have a ceasefire, essentially, in this situation, like, we do in Ukraine, fewer people dying as a result of the ceasefire yesterday. If the ceasefire is caused by sanctions, then I guess that's offense for you. But then we read the CSIS evidence that says that you were primarily spurred by the threat of an influx of arms into Ukraine from the United States government. A threat of an... So... So you're telling me that the United States is supporting Ukrainian government? Yeah, they are, they are supporting the Ukrainian government. Which would mean that's what spurred so the civil war in the first place. Would you define Ukraine's military as modernized? I would say that they're not really that modernized. We're giving them some guns. But they're using Western technology. Well, they don't have that much of it because the Russian government still has more than Russia, right? Because Russia, Russia has zero. zero. No, Russian has like a, I'm pretty right. sure. So I'm seeing a problem in the case here. If you're telling me that no, Russia no. doesn't need a modernized military to combat Ukraine, no, no. But then you're going to stand here and tell me that Ukraine is using Western technology, so, so it would seem to well, me that Russia's going to feel first, different. First, so the evidence that we read from CSIS says that it was a threat. I don't even know if there are actually guns right there. What I'm telling you is that right now the relationship between the Ukraine and between NATO and between Russia implies that there might be some American involvement, which is why they're saying that right now we're approaching the brink of an all-out NATO-Russia war. That's great. Unfortunately, that's not what the topic is about. When we start talking about anything that occurs in the future tense, it literally so becomes not resolution. So I'd say I'm like, trying I'd to prove to you right now. Like, long-term sure. impacts are impacts. Not no, they're right. not. They're Present not impacts, we, when we talk about the resolution, we yeah. need to discuss yeah. whether in this round, we see that the Russian threat has decreased no, since last year. We see that they, a thing last that year, predict, no, like last year, Last year, Russia was threatening to seize Kiev and Mariupol, and this year, they no longer have the capability to do so because they don't have the technology. says that it probably wasn't because of sanctions. You might want to take a look at that CSIS part. Actually, we don't need They're more likely to act out and act preemptively in order to stop them because they feel that they aren't able to defend against any threats against other nations. At that point, that's a proof that Russia is going to act more preemptively in the future and more aggressive. They try and give you this analysis that the only impacts that matter are impacts in the present tense. But at that point, to ignore all foreign policy goals and all future goals of sanctions is simply ludicrous in the world of foreign policy. At that point, let's go on to our flow. 
The first thing he reads is he reads against nationalism. There's violations of the social contract, and that's going to end up making a world where there's uh, where econ's going to happen. David tells you in a rebuttal that according to Pexin, uh, sanctions end up increasing repression. So even if there are violations of the social contract, any movement that's trying to stop it and overthrow Putin is going to end up creating a world where those people are shut down and made it so they can't rise up and can't actually point out the violations of the social contract, which Pexin quantifies as a 16% increase, decrease in democracy in the long term. Now let's go on to the second war, which is oligarchs. One of the major points here is he says that the liberal people and the liberal oligarchs are the ones that are pressuring Putin. Those only matter to the extent that they stay in power. And we read to in case that they're getting kicked out of power. The pro-Western liberal elites are the ones that are getting pushed out of Russian governments in favor of the military hardliners who are far against the West. This weighs in two ways. First, getting rid of the pro-Westerners ends up creating a world where uh, Russia has less positive forward policy towards the West. In the long term, it means that the West isn't going to be as beneficial towards Russia's policies. Second, by putting in military hardliners, that means a long term <coughs> increase in aggression because those people are more likely to want to project their military might on other people. We end up empiricizing this with the Economist card, who explains that the things that Russians care about are A, military might, and B, econ. And when econ goes down, military might has to go up in order to keep the Russian people happy. Then he tries to, he, first of all, he drops like skin in the bottom case where he says an overall 70% decrease in conflict because of deterrence in the long term. Or increase in conflict, sorry. At the end of the day, we also give, uh, with Ukraine, our evidence is from December 31st, December 30th. For these reasons. Um, just a quick off camera that I'm hitting the turn on the case and then going straight down the numbers. Ready? Remember that the turn is that whenever the countries can't modernize, they're going to be more likely to act militarily. But there's a huge contradiction because remember in rebuttal they tell you that Russia is shielding their budget, meaning that they're still going to modernize anyways. At the point where we're running these two contradictory arguments, go ahead and drop the turn and the um, uh, response that they're giving you, otherwise because it's abusive for them to run both. Now go to the first vote, which is going to be occupation, the third link on our first contention. They completely drop this uh, um, link that we give you that says when you have economic sanctions, you have that economic harm, they're less likely to be able to afford to occupy other countries. This is really important because remember PASCO's analysis tells us that because they aren't able to have that military spending, what's going to happen is they aren't able to seize more land. Look at the example he gives you of Kiev that says they literally weren't able to uh, like take over Kiev simply because economic sanctions took away their ability to have uh, occupy. At the point where they're not dropping this, you can literally outweigh this entire case here because they can't, they can't have more aggression if they can't afford to have it. But then, the second vote is going to be the return of the Jedi. Remember that my partner comes up here and tells you that monetary benefits are always going to outweigh. Even if there's a short-term increase in nationalism, if there's no economic tangibility of prospects, that's going to immediately turn that because in the long-term Putin's regime is going to collapse because of the social contract. At the point where they're not responding to that, link, resp uh, that response specifically, you can clearly extend that, and this is really important because remember the links they're giving you about nationalism are going to drop specifically right there because it's going to go away in the long term. If they want to look at long-term impacts, then the only side solving for that is the pro. But then remember that on top of that, they talk to uh, pro-Western liberals. It's really important to remember that if pro-Western liberals are so important, they should have already done something at the point where they haven't. Don't give them any offers on that. You can delink that right there. But then third, look to Letsky, and who they try to extend around. Uh, Letsky, in an analysis about Russia specifically, says that economic sanctions are the only option we have left. You can directly end that there. But then the third link is going to, the third voter is going to be negotiations. There's CSIS evidence about the threat to the, um, the threatening of legal weapons is really important because it's Simone de Galbert who says that the only way to have these negotiations and the best way to have these negotiations is actually through economic sanctions, turn their response against them because it literally concludes pro. And then on top of that, even if you're not looking at that, remember that we showed you in the last week, uh, ceasefire violations has gone down overall from 50 to 12, and imperfect ceasefires are always going to be better than no ceasefires. For all these reasons, I strongly urge to pro-balance. Ready for grand cross? What's up, always? Right, everyone good? Yep. Let me get the first one. Go for it. Okay, so I think we can all agree that like, long-term impacts probably outweigh short Definitely not. Why so, not? like, this is a really important point around, right? I know that it seems like, I'm not trying to say that's like a ridiculous idea. What I am trying to tell you is that what the result asks us to analyze is what's happening today. And the reason well, that's important, so, so, no, like, listen, 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 so let, me, like, let me explain. The reason that's important is because when we start getting into arguments about trying to assess what Russia will do in the future, it becomes no longer about the effect sanctions have had up until this point, which is what the debate is about. Sure. So if you threaten to punch me, and the impact is you punching me, then that would be a threat that is going to happen. I wouldn't punch you if we had a ceasefire. <laughs> in, the, like, in the case of this hypothetical situation, I would say like there are a couple problems, right? Threats are inherently like we're, we're reducing the threat, we're making sure the right. future threats. Threats isn't 
as threats isn't in the a threat is always in the future. Like I always like if I threaten you like, now, can, the action is. I don't. I, I definitely don't want to turn the round into like an English lesson because that would be like super it's, like it's weird. Super but like pretty we're talking like, about whether or not the threat exists right like, now still matter. Like we can't just ignore foreign okay. policy goals, all sanctions just because they have it. I'll ignore what the resolution asked me to. Do you mind if I ask a question? <laughs> what? So when you when you start talking about the Ukraine, right? Right. At the be like before sanctions were implemented, we're talking like early 2014. What did Putin say his goal was in the Ukraine specifically? Well, he says a lot of things, but his tactics show. Let's talk about the capital. Right? No, no. His, his goals right now are mainly to destabilize Ukraine, to destabilize other countries. Is Kiev key to that? Uh, I would say. So. Well, I would say that even if he hasn't seized Kiev, he's got a lot of destabilization. Is his goal to take Kiev? Do you think? I don't think his goal is to take Kiev. So I don't think then, he gains an advantage from pushing I, himself. One of his major goal. goals is to make sure he controls pretty much all the Russian majority population in like Ukraine, oh, which is mostly in eastern Ukraine and Crimea. He hasn't taken all of this from there. So really, that's where look at what's going on in Ukraine right now, right? Like, there are literally fights going on inside the, inside the parliament, like people punching each other, because the situation's gotten so destabilized by Russian right. policy. I would say that's a pretty weak example of destabilization, like two rich men I mean, fighting over a like, corrupted Ukrainian government. I would say the more apt example that we should be looking at is the fact that the goal of sanctions was to stop Putin in his tracks and decrease the threat. At the moment so, sanctions were implemented, the threat was so that Russia was going to steamroll into Kiev and Mariupol and seize that land. So if okay. this threat redirects, then it would be either null or it where is it redirected? Be null or it's redirected. Show me where it's redirected today. Well, we say that it's redirected towards Syria. We also say that it's redirected. Sure. We Syria with the Cossack who tells you that it's redirected towards other tactics. If, if we vote, if even if we voted next today, wait, wait. they would stay in Syria because oh. President Obama wants okay. them in Syria. Like, no, I, I don't think that it makes changes, sense. It changes like his policies in Syria. Like right now, his policies aren't just like the. Like quintessential fighting ISIS arguments, he's also trying to fight with the Free Syrian Army and the rebel groups that are fighting. Even if, like, even if we buy into side. that, even if we buy into that argument, the point becomes totally null at the point where the West quote like is saying that they want that to happen. No, no, they, they want Russia to <laughs> So their first order is that if they lose economic benefits, then they're no longer going to be able to occupy land. Remember what we tell you is that in the long term, they're going to be more incentivized to attempt to destabilize places, which is why the cosmic evidence we read you to tell you that Putin's strategies have shifted towards more tactics of destabilization that ultimately result in longer conflicts that prolong the situation in Ukraine, harm more Western lives in the long term, and ultimately lead to more intervention in places like Syria. Then they read you a bunch of social contracts. So Casper already responded to that when he tells you that the social contract being violated, the only recompense for that is, according to the economist, more power projection abroad, which goes unresponded to that's the overview that you can extend clearly throughout the round that turns their entire case. But then they tell you that they, Obama says that he wants Putin in Syria. He wants Putin in Syria on their side. He doesn't want them fighting the Free Syrian Army, whose leader they killed two weeks ago, but he doesn't want them fighting the Kurdish Peshmerga, who they're supporting through their support of Aragon. But then remember, moreover, if you're, if you're like bolstering ISIS by fighting the people that are fighting ISIS, that's ultimately against Western interests. So Syria is a voter on our side. Then remember, their response to Letsky and what dropped through our rebuttal, they respond to it in summer and after. I have no prep time. In fairness, like, give us that impact. 17% increase. <laughs> then on, on our case, we give you a couple of reasons to vote for us. First, the increase in repression from Texan. He tells you there's a 16% increase in repression, which means ultimately the, the liberal population that they use to attempt to turn our argument against us is going to be decreased in terms of their impact on Russian policy because sanctions insulate them from that population. But then we tell you that the people that are in power, that liberal opposition that they talk about, are losing power right now as a result of sanctions because they have less money. They have less political influence. And what happens is the military hardliners that are now put in power are already more aggressive. Now we tell you that those are the same people that are advocating for 100,000 more troops in Ukraine. So even if you don't buy any of our analysis, the fact that the military hardliners are being pushed into power is going to turn their entire case against them. Moreover, we tell you that like they go up and tell you that suddenly they're, like people are still going to be as aggressive. Remember, this is what insulates Putin from his from his people. The fact that he's a scapegoat against all of his harms, a, pill, uh, like a bunch of people that he can rile his government around, ultimately to, to the extent of more aggression. And what this means is that even in the Short, even if in the short term they win Ukraine, which they're clearly not, because the intervention as per Galbert, oh, like the, the, only the shipment of guns started changing anything. The long-term impacts, the implications of a stronger anti-Western response lead to significantly more conflicts in the long term, which outweighs everything. Thank you, Russell.
going to be three huge reasons we need to be voting absent today's debate, so let's start at the top. Remember that the, or it's going to be, first first is going to be occupation. First, remember they drop occupation until final focus. So when he comes up here and literally tells you that you can't weigh our response because it's in summary, don't give him credit on weighing occupation in the final focus, which means that this vote extends all the way through. It's really important to understand because their entire impact of how they're garnering offense is that Putin is seizing more land. It literally becomes impossible to seize land at the point where Putin can't even hold the land he's trying to. That's the reason he didn't seize Kiev. That's the reason he didn't seize Mariupol is because he doesn't have the technology to hold it. Remember that he gets up here in my crossfire and can see that Ukraine is using Western technology by into the link that says that Russia can't get Western technology. At that point, Russia's modernization is necessary to occupy, and when they can't occupy, we don't see the threat increasing, we see it decreasing. Remember, we see Kiev and Mariupol as the materialization of this. This is important to the round because they literally give you zero materializations in Ukraine after rebuttal when I respond to every single one of their points and tell you that Ukraine has gotten better. They also drop the argument that a ceasefire with violations is better than no ceasefire at all because we see saved lives and fewer casualties. The second voter is going to be domestic support. Remember, we tell you that money is key to backing the social contract. They get up here and they just argue over and over again that the social contract can be fulfilled by, by uh, expanding their like expanding foreign policy goals, but they don't respond to the idea that foreign policy goals were literally already part of Putin's agenda. That's why he invaded Ukraine in the first place. That uniqueness argument goes unresponded to. They don't have anything left to argue there. But then, we should be seeing the results of these pro-West arguments that they're making. They tell you that there are all these pro-Westerners are existing in Putin's elite. Then why for the last 30 years has Russia had so much anti-Western sentiment like they tell you there is? Otherwise, we should have seen a materialization. Sharple says that in summary, so flow it through. The third voter is going to be credibility. Remember, we see that Putin has been deterred as a result of there not being enough resources for him to modernize. At the point where they're telling you Ukraine has modernization, but Russia doesn't, then we're going to have to vote out because on the simple idea that Russia hasn't expanded any more than it had when we implemented sanctions. We stopped them cold in their tracks, and that's why the Death Star blew up. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you for having me.